This video compares the 1995 New American Standard Bible to the 2016 English Standard Version. I'll refer to them as the NAS and the ESV. Here's an outline of the contents of the video. A more detailed listing should appear in the description of the video below. By the way, to keep this video from approaching Ben-Hur in length, I'll not describe each chart in detail. You may wish to pause the video from time to time and read the words I leave unspoken. We'll begin with some background on the two translations. This chart shows a partial family tree of descendants of the King James Version. Both the New American Standard and the English Standard Versions are descended from the American Standard Version of 1901, the ESV through an intermediary, which is the 1971 edition of the Revised Standard Version, or RSV. A few details on the history and translation philosophy for both are presented here. We just mentioned that the NAS is derived from the American Standard Version. The goal was to produce an evangelical alternative to the Revised Standard Version. The NAS was published in increments, beginning with the Gospel of John back in the 1960s. The complete Bible was finally published in 1971. It was modified a few times over the years. Most significantly, the 1995 update removed the thous and these previously used when referring to God. It also deleted a number of conjunctions and replaced some pronouns with proper names. The NAS is advertised as the most literal modern English translation, but the way I measure literalness, that isn't so, as you'll see on a subsequent chart. The NAS Old Testament is based on an earlier edition of Biblia Hebraica, and its New Testament is based on the 26th edition of the Nestle Aland Greek text. The 26th edition is only slightly different from the latest edition, the 28th, on which the ESV New Testament is based. I'll refer to those editions as NA26 and NA28 in this video. We'll see later that the NAS New Testament actually appears closer to the 19th century Greek New Testament edition of Westcott and Hort than to NA26, based on my own admittedly limited examination. The ESV comes from the RSV. Its editors call it an essentially literal translation. That means it, quote, seeks as far as possible to reproduce the precise wording of the original text and the personal style of each Bible writer. As such, its emphasis is on word-for-word -word correspondence, unquote. All that said, it is, in my view, less literal than the NAS. The ESV is based on the 5th edition of the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia, an edition of the Masoretic Text, but the translators sometimes depart from it in favor of the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient translations of the Hebrew Bible, like the Septuagint. The ESV's New Testament is translated from NA28, but as you'll see, the translators made their own textual choices. In a video available here on YouTube, Dr. William Muntz, famous for his textbook, Basics of Biblical Greek, states that he and his father were, were responsible for the vast majority of differences between the RSV and the ESV. I believe he means in the New Testament. I recommend you watch that video. This chart lists well-known personalities who use or have used each translation. I haven't been able to verify every entry, and some of them are based on old data, such as books published in the 1980s, so take this list with a grain of salt. We move now to the next major bullet on the, on the outline, general differences. The NAS has a number of features that distinguish it from the ESV, like italics for translators supplied interpretive language, capitalized pronouns when those pronouns refer to God, small capitals for text in the New Testament quoted from the Old, and an asterisk to indicate that a verb translated in the past tense is actually a present tense verb in the Greek. The ESV, on the other hand, provides footnotes to distinguish the singular you from the plural you. Both translations seem to have purged much of the rich vocabulary used in early translations. Here, the NAS has at least retained the word swine, and here, tongue, 
but in Acts 2.17, the ESV retained a flesh, while the NAS went with the insipid word mankind and relegated the literal reading to a footnote. And here in Acts 13.35, it did the same thing with C. Corruption. I'll say this again later, but one of my major issues with the NAS is the fact that it places so many literal readings in footnotes. But to its credit, the 1995 NAS retains that quaint word, brethren. I expect that to change when the next edition of the NAS is published, perhaps in 2021. It will likely replace brethren with brothers and sisters. The ESV sometimes retains the word multitude, where the NAS has crowd. I don't know what's wrong with multitude. The ESV uses election, while the NAS replaces that with phrases like his choice. I'm not sure why. Happily, both translations continue to use theological jargon like justification, sanctification, and redemption. They both use the word shall also. The informal speech mafia would like to see that word go away. Now we'll transition to a discussion of the Old Testament textual basis of the two translations. Here and throughout this video, we'll compare the two translations to each other, but from time to time, we'll take a backward glance and compare them to their predecessors, the American Standard Version and the Revised Standard Version. The English Standard Version relies on the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient translations much more often than the NAS does. I examined both translations in 67 spots where the Masoretic text differs from the Dead Sea Scrolls or the ancient versions. The NAS departed from the Masoretic 9% of the time, the ESV 30% of the time. Part of the difference is due to the influence of the RSV on the ESV. The RSV often translated readings from the Septuagint, but the RSV Old Testament was published in 1952, just a few years after the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and too soon to make much use of them. So some of the Dead Sea Scroll usage in the ESV is due to the initiative of the ESV translation team itself. Our first example is Deuteronomy 32.8. The NAS reads the sons of Israel at the end of the verse, while the ESV has the sons of God. The NAS follows the Masoretic text, as you can see from the ESV's footnote. The ESV follows a Dead Sea Scroll reading here. It also agrees with the Revised Standard Version, which apparently came up with the phrase sons of God based on other sources. This chart simply identifies the Dead Sea Scroll responsible for the reading. Our next example comes from Deuteronomy 32:43. The ESV is quite a bit longer here than the NAS, since it includes the added material from the Dead Sea Scrolls shown in red. There are also a few other differences shown in blue. The NAS translates the Masoretic text and is very close to its parent here. The ESV innovated here by including the Dead Sea Scroll material that was absent from the RSV. For the record, I show here the source for Bow Down to Him All Gods. The same scroll is the source for He Repays Those Who Hate Him. Here in the 144th Psalm, we see a small difference at the end of verse 2. The ESV follows a reading that is in a few Hebrew manuscripts, but also in a Dead Sea Scroll. The NAS follows the reading in the majority of Hebrew manuscripts. In doing so, it remains very close to the ASV. The ESV and the RSV agree on ending verse 2 with peoples and not my people, but the ESV differs from the RSV in a few other ways in this passage. The NAS Translation Committee in charge of revising it for 2021 does not seem inclined to make use of the Dead Sea Scrolls here. From time to time, the Lachman Foundation posts extracts from the upcoming edition of the NAS at its Facebook page. A post that included this passage left my people unchanged. Here again, I identify the Dead Sea Scroll just for completeness. Here in Isaiah chapter 21 verse 8, the words in blue are just two different ways of saying the same thing. Both the NAS and the ESV are translating a Dead Sea Scroll reading, as their footnotes indicate. The NAS departs from its parent, the ASV, which translated the Masoretic texts, He cried as a lion. Another example of where the NAS follows a Dead Sea Scroll reading is 
is in Isaiah 49:24. The RSV followed the Dead Sea Scroll reading here, even though the scrolls had only recently been discovered, but the RSV footnote attributes the reading to an unidentified source. The ESV is very close to the RSV in this passage. Here again, I identify the Dead Sea Scroll in question. The next few examples will show departures from the Masoretic text in the direction of an ancient translation like the Septuagint. In this passage, the question is whether Pharaoh made servants of his people or removed them to the cities. You can see from the footnote on the right that the ESV follows a reading present in the Samaritan Pentateuch, the Septuagint, and the Vulgate. It does not follow the Hebrew or Masoretic reading, which is, remove them to the cities. The NAS, following the Masoretic text, reads like the ASV, but in a footnote, the ASV mentions the reading the ESV follows. The NAS does not include a similar footnote. The ESV keeps in line with the RSV here. The RSV also followed the reading, made slaves of them, present in the ancient translations. The next example comes from 1 Samuel 9.25. Did Samuel speak with Saul on the roof, or did Saul sleep there in the bed that had been prepared for him? The ESV follows the Septuagint here, while the NAS, as is usual, follows the Masoretic text. The NAS modernized the ASV a bit, replacing communed with with spoke to. The ESV is even closer to the RSV. It replaced the RSVs upon with on. In passing, I note that the NAS footnote is misleading as written, since it indicates what the Greek adds, but fails to state what the Greek omits. Just to remind you, the theme of this section is that the ESV follows the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient translations more frequently than the NAS does. In this case, we see a somewhat lengthy section of text in the ESV, which is not present in the NAS. The shorter version of the passage is based on the Masoretic text, which the NAS follows like the ASV before it. The ESV once again agrees with the RSV and inserts the material in blue from the Septuagint. The NET Bible provides a note that explains how the text may have disappeared from the Hebrew manuscripts during the copying process. In 1 Samuel 14.41, we see another instance where the ESV text is considerably longer than that printed in the NAS. The NAS is shorter because it translates the Masoretic text, which is shorter. The ESV follows the RSV's example in translating an ancient translation, in this case material from the Latin and Greek. I show here this passage in the Latin-based Douay Reims Bible to display its similarity to the ESV. In verse 1 of Psalm 38, the ESV includes the words, O Lord, not present in the NAS, and there is no footnote. Not surprisingly, the words were supplied from the Septuagint, though they are said to be present in some Hebrew manuscripts also. In verse 13 of Psalm 145, the ESV again adds material from the Septuagint, shown here in blue. Psalm 145 is an, is an acrostic in which each line begins with a letter from the Hebrew alphabet, but one letter is missing in most Hebrew manuscripts. It is supplied as shown in blue from the Septuagint and other sources. The NAS translates the shorter version of the psalm from the Masoretic text without the material in blue. The ESV supplied the material for the missing letter from the Septuagint as the RSV had done before it. So to sum up, we've seen one clear contrast between the two translations. The NAS, like the ASV before it, generally sticks to the Masoretic Hebrew. The ESV, on the other hand, is more willing to depart from the Masoretic text to follow readings found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and ancient translations, like the Septuagint. We'll leave the Old Testament behind now and proceed to examine differences in these two translations that are due to the fact that they start from different Greek sources. Our first example is from Mark 7.14, where you see a striking difference at the end of the passage. The ESV talks about washing dining couches, and the NAS does not. As you can see from footnote B under the NAS text, 
the word translated as washing is actually baptizing. As you can imagine, this passage comes up in discussions of the mode of baptism. Were dining couches immersed? The NAS omits and dining couches, and so follows the lead of the ASB. Interestingly, by omitting and dining couches, the NAS agrees with Westcott and Hort's 19th century Greek New Testament, and it disagrees with NA28. The ESV includes and dining couches. In doing so, it disagrees with its predecessor, the RSV, which relegated it to a footnote. The ESV translates the NA28 in this passage. For those interested, I mention here some of the manuscripts that weigh in on this issue. As a second example, consider Colossians 3.6, where the NAS includes pawn the sons of disobedience, but the ESV does not. Here the NAS translates the Greek text present in NA28, and it does so in agreement with its predecessor, the ASV. By omitting upon the sons of disobedience, the ESV follows the example of its parent, the RSV, in translating the text present in Westcott and Hort. Here again I name some of the manuscripts that weigh in on this question. It's curious that the ESV footnote refers to the majority of manuscripts with the word some. Our third example is from Hebrews 2.7, where the NAS includes the words, and have appointed him over the works of your hands. In following the ASV's lead in including these words, the NAS agrees with West Cotton Hort, as it did in our first example. The ESV omits them in agreement with the RSV. Here the ESV follows its base text, the NA28. Here again, I name some of the manuscripts that support each reading and point out the interesting fact that although the words and have appointed him over the works of your hands are not in the majority text, they are in the King James Version. The KJV is based on the so-called Textus Receptus, and this is one of the places where the Textus Receptus disagrees with the text providentially preserved in the Eastern Roman Empire. In this fourth example, the ESV mentions unclean and detestable beasts, where the NAS only speaks about unclean and hateful birds. In neglecting the beasts, the NAS agrees with the ASV and translates the text in Westcott and Hort's Greek New Testament, as it did in our first and third examples. The Revised Standard Version also omitted mention of the unclean and detestable beasts, but NA28 includes these words, and the ESV dutifully translates NA28 in this verse and a few words about manuscripts and resources that give reasons for including them. The next six charts show some of the more interesting differences I've found between the ESV and the NAS New Testaments that are due to the fact that they translate different Greek texts. Of interest on the first chart is Matthew 12:47, which the NAS includes in the text and the ESV relegates to a footnote. The ESV text is generally longer in the verses shown on this chart, Notice here that in the NAS version of Luke 10.1, the Lord appointed 72. In the ESV's version, the Lord appointed only 70. In Romans 15.19, the ESV reads, Spirit of God, like the King James Version. The NAS has simply spirit. The ASV had Holy Spirit at that spot. The inclusion of the word pure at 1 Peter 1.22 also brings the ESV closer to the KJV. Several interesting differences are displayed on this chart. The ESV has chains of darkness in 2 Peter 2.4 like the KJV. The NAS has pits of darkness like the ASV. In 2 Peter 3.10, the ESV states that the earth and its works will be exposed, while the NAS will have them be burned up, as in the older translations. And there is a rather famous difference in Jude verse 5, where the NAS reads Lord, but the ESV has Jesus saving a people out of the land of Egypt. This chart, along with the next two, presents the results of my comparisons of multiple English translations with various Greek New Testaments. This one shows percent agreement with NA28 on the vertical or Y axis, and with Robinson Pierpont's Byzantine text form on the horizontal or X axis. The results are based on 153 locations in the New Testament where there are translatable textual variants. The ESV agrees with NA28 more frequently than the NAS does. 
neither translation agrees with the Byzantine text much more than 40% of the time. This chart again shows percentage agreement with NA28 on the y-axis, but now agreement with Westcott and Hort is displayed on the horizontal axis. The 1995 NAS has the second highest rate of agreement with Westcott and Hort I've measured. Even so, it disagrees with Westcott and Hort 30% of the time. On this chart, I display agreement with the Tyndall House Greek New Testament on the horizontal axis. Agreement rates for the ESV and the NAS are both below 55%. To learn more details, such as which verses were examined and how the translations were scored, see the video entitled A Four-Dimensional Perspective on Bible Translations at this YouTube channel. We'll shift gears now and discuss how literal the translations are. The NAS is somewhat more literal, the way I define it, but not always. We'll look at a few examples. We'll start at Romans chapter 1 verse 5 through 6, and discuss the words in blue and red. Early in the passage, both the NAS and the ESV translate the Greek word eis with to bring about. My problem with to bring about is that it seems to mark Paul's apostleship as the sole cause of the obedience of faith. Both unto, as in the ASV, and for in the KJV are better here because they are less specific. The NAS, at least, provides a better translation and a footnote. In the next verse, the NAS's among whom you also are is closer to the Greek. The ESV conveys the meaning, though it fails to include the Greek word the NAS translates as also. The final phrase is called of Jesus Christ. The ESV's to belong to, which comes from the RSV, is one likely meaning in the context, but the lack of italics prevents the reader from considering other possibilities. The next example is taken from Matthew chapter 10, verse 41. This verse contains expressions in Greek that are literally rendered in the name of. The RSV assisted the reader by interpreting the expression as, because he is. In the ESV, let the RSV's interpretation stand. But because he is is plainly less literal than in the name of. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30 shows a contest between sleep and have died. The NAS is more literal here. Not only does the Greek word literally mean sleep, but it is in the present tense. The RSV introduced, and some have died, likely to explain the euphemism. The ESV allowed that translation to stand. Our fourth example comes from John's Gospel, the 12th chapter, the 16th verse. I note in passing that the ESV is easier to read in the first line because it follows the normal English word order of subject, verb, object. The NAS, in line with the ASV, mimics the Greek word order of object, word, subject. The ESV is somewhat non-literal in the way it translates the Greek verb epiesen, they had done, as if it were passive, had been done. Doing so creates a parallel between these things had been written about him and these things had been done to him, which makes for more graceful English, but it is less literal than the NAS. The ESV is similar to the RSV here. The NAS follows the ASV, which reads, and that they had done these things unto him. In the next example, taken from Second Peter chapter 1, verse 10, the ESV is more literal. First, notice that in this verse, the NAS seems more Calvinistic than the ESV. His calling and choosing you implies that God is the one who elects the individual. The ESV's wording, taken in isolation, allows one to assume that we elect ourselves. The Greek reads as shown on the chart and may be translated literally as, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure. For doing these things, you will not ever stumble. Compare that to the ESV's translation, and you'll see that the ESV is more literal. The NAS inserts his without the use of italics, though his is absent from the original, and it replaces your with you. Some people take offense, rightly, I think, at the widely repeated criticism that the NAS is woodenly literal and features awkward readings. A champion of the NAS challenged people on Facebook to name one verse in which the NAS is more awkward than the ESV.
I submitted this verse as an example. It came as no surprise to me when the NAS defender disagreed, but it seems obvious that in this instance, the NAS is not only less literal than the ESV, but it is also somewhat awkward. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 provides another example of where the ESV is more literal than the NAS. As acknowledged by the NAS footnote, the prayers is more literal than to pray. It is not difficult to find examples where the ESV presents literal readings, the NAS relegates to its footnotes. It's not clear why the NAS removes so many literal translations from the text. This characteristic of the NAS is troublesome, especially since some editions of the NAS omit these useful footnotes. Based on a posting at the Lockman Foundation's Facebook page, it appears that the upcoming edition of the NAS will retain the less literal to pray in the text. Of course, it's easy to cherry-pick verses where one translation is more literal than the other. This chart was based on examining translations in 200 verses chosen at random and counting what I call liberties. Example liberties are listed on the chart. As you can see, over the 200 verses I examined, the 1995 NAS was somewhat more literal than the ESV. It was less literal than the 1977 NAS, largely because it replaces pronouns like he with proper names like Jesus and because it deletes conjunctions. One example is at Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, where the 1977 NAS has the pronoun he, which is literal. The 1995 NAS has the dragon, which is an explanation. In the next section, we'll examine the development of each translation, starting with the ASV, their most recent common ancestor, We'll also spend some time discussing the translation of the Greek imperfect tense to help understand the changes introduced by the NAS. We'll begin with the development of the ESV. Here we see the text of Luke chapter 8, verses 40 through 42, along with verse 53. The text is displayed in three translations, the 1901 American Standard Version, the 1946 Revised Standard Version, and the 2016 ESV. I chose the 1946 RSV as the intermediate point because more changes were introduced between 1901 and 1946 than afterwards. Looking at the two columns to the left of the chart, we see that the RSV replaced and with now, replaced multitude with crowd, deleted a semicolon in favor of a comma, removed behold, replaced multitudes with people, replaced thronged with pressed around, and rejected laughed him to scorn in favor of laughed at him. I'm not sure why. I still hear the expression laughed to scorn. Frankly, I don't think the changes introduced in 1946 were real improvements, but I'm a dinosaur. So next, let's look at the changes that occurred over the 70 years between 1946 and 2016 in this passage. We lost another semicolon, replaced by a full stop. Besought became implored. The Greek text doesn't include the name Jesus, but using it helps resolve a possible ambiguity. The people pressed around Jesus, not Jairus. So the ESV tidied up the RSV a bit. It deleted a detestable semicolon, replaced that inscrutable word besought, and clarified a point which I doubt ever confused anyone. With that, we'll move to the evolution of the NAS. The 1901 ASV remains our starting point. In the middle is the 1963 NAS. The 1995 NAS is the end point. Like the 1946 RSV, the 1963 NAS made minor punctuation changes. It retained multitude and multitudes. The 1963 NAS retained behold, but dropped laughed him to scorn in favor of began laughing at him. Notice that capitalized pronouns for deity were already present in the 1963 edition. The 1963 NAS also replaced the ASV's were waiting past continuous tense, with had been waiting, past perfect continuous tense. 
The change may be due to the fact that the Greek verb of being, eson, is in the imperfect tense, and the translators wish to express its durative sense. More significantly, in 1963, the NAS began these began to constructions with the word began in italics. If you see began to in the NAS with the word began in italics, that's a signal that they're translating the Greek in perfect tense. Sometimes you'll find began to in the NAS without italics, like in Mark 13.5. In cases like that, a Greek word corresponding to began is present in the text. If began is in italics, the translators want you to understand that the Greek verb here to entreat or to laugh is in the imperfect tense and that they understand it in an inceptive sense. In my opinion, the past tense, besought, entreated, or implored, works better here than began to entreat. After all, Jairus didn't just begin to entreat Jesus, he actually entreated Jesus. The mourners didn't simply begin to laugh at the Lord, they actually laughed at him. The change from the past tense thronged to the past continuous, or pressing, is also due to the Greek verb in the imperfect tense. Here the imperfect is understood to be durative rather than inceptive. I think we're pressing works well in this instance, since the thronging occurs continuously as Jesus passes. Next, let's glance at the changes between 1963 and 1995. First, the word multitude lost its place in favor of people, and multitudes became crowds. A footnote was added to explain that people really means crowd. The word behold was deleted, and entreat gave way to implore. Incidentally, all these changes in blue were introduced in the 1995 edition. And so, after that multitude of revisions, we have the two translations as they stand today. Overall, they still seem quite similar. The most significant differences involve capitalized pronouns and representations of the Greek imperfect tense. Examples of where this practice using a continuous past tense English verb to represent a Greek verb in the imperfect tense, simply does not work well in the NES, are easy to find. In the example from Luke chapter 6 verse 5, the Pharisees confronted the Lord after his disciples picked heads of grain on the Sabbath. He reminded them that David and his companions had eaten the consecrated bread, then concluded by asserting that he himself was Lord of the Sabbath. By translating the Greek verb elegan with the English expression was saying, the NAS gives the impression that the Lord made that assertion repeatedly in those exact words. The ESV sometimes translate the Greek imperfect tense in this way also. Mark chapter 11 verse 17 is an example. This chart summarizes my editorial comments about the NAS and the Greek imperfect tense. In the interest of time, I'll move to the next topic, gender issues, but feel free to pause the video here.